Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Sam, for your kind introduction. I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation to Professor James Howcroft and his team for the invitation to speak to you today about Australia's approach to managing the foreign fighter threat. I guess it was an old soldier's instincts that prompted me to open Frank Lewis's most recent email that included the final schedule. As lo and behold, my slot had been moved from the last session on the last day to the first session on the first day. So much for the notes in my draft presentation to prompt me to plagiarise the best ideas from my follow, fellow presenters already outlined to you. I think Jim must have seen through me from afar. I hope that an Australian perspective will offer some breadth to, what, to the undoubtedly excellent contributions we can expect to hear over the next few days from eminent guest speakers, moderators and you, the participants. In particular, I'd like to congratulate our previous speaker, Colonel Antonio Sugarol from the Philippines, for an excellent presentation, which set the scene for our focus on the Asian context. I hope that my presentation will provide some useful points of contrast to frame our subsequent discussion. I guess the major lesson to be learned, and it will be reinforced for all of us over the next few days, will that be that although our national circumstances and societies differ in many ways, we all share the common threat posed by foreign fighters. I believe we all recognise, or will come to recognise, that no one state has a magic bullet that can be applied to the problem, and that a collective approach to the problem offers the best prospects for success. And that perhaps more importantly, that none of us have a mortgage on good ideas, or what should be considered as best practice. If each of us take home just one or two good ideas which have not yet been tried in our own countries, this community of interest gathering will indeed have been a great success. To end my introduction, I would ask you to note that I am speaking to you today in a personal capacity rather than as a representative of the Australian Government. Also, that the information in my presentation is based entirely on open sources and that responsibility for any flawed analysis or shallow commentary is entirely my own. My scope is out, outlined on this slide. I think I missed one. Let's see if we can pick it up. No, it's not there. There we go. Out of, out of sequence. When looking at what I'm sure is a familiar slide to all of you, showing foreign fighter fl flows into the Middle East region, you should note that for the purposes of our discussions this week, all of the arrows on the slide should also reflect the potential for a two-way flow that is, a return to our own home countries. Turning first to the nature of the foreign threat facing Australia, I'd ask you to take note of the following points. In September 2014, for the first time, Australia's national public alert level was raised to high, reflecting the judgement of security agencies that a terrorist attack was considered likely. This heightened threat level is unchanged and is likely to endure. While Daesh is currently the most threatening manifestation of this threat, AQ and its affiliates are widely assessed to retain both the threat and the capability to mount major attacks. As ex existing violent extremist influences in Australia may be exacerbated by Australian foreign fighters returning from the conflicts in Syria and Iraq. There are believed to be around 110 Australians currently fighting in Syria and Iraq, who for the most part are fighting for Daesh. Around 40 to 50 per cent of them appear to be dual nationals. Though relatively small compared to many of your countries, we believe this is a higher number than for either Canada or the United States. Around 40 Australians are believed to have been killed to date in Syria and Iraq. Around 30 Australians have returned so far from the conflict. 
Around 150 Australians are believed to be providing support to individuals and groups in the Syria-Iraq conflicts through financing and recruitment. The number of Australians with hands-on terrorist experience in Syria and Iraq is now several times what it was in Afghanistan, two-thirds of whom became involved in terrorist activity following return to Australia. Of real concern is our understanding of the level of experience, that is, exposure to actual combat and the exploitation of violence for violence' sake, is much higher than in Iraq and Syria than it was for what we refer to as our AFPAC alumni. Should this proportion prove to have continuing relevance, we can expect around 100 or so combat experienced foreign fighters and support staff to potentially become involved with terrorist activity on their return to Australia. Add in the unknown number of self-radicalised Australians with an urge to directly participate or support terrorist operations and the numbers grow substantially. I must acknowledge, of course, that the numbers of foreign fighters confronting the security agencies in many of your home states are much, much larger. But Australia's circumstances remain, for Australians and our regional neighbours, of real concern. The final dimension of the threat that I wish to identify is that a number of South East Asian foreign fighters operating overseas who pose a threat to both Australians travelling and or living in South East Asia and the stability of those same South East Asian states. The reason being that the great majority of Australian nationals who have been killed by terrorists over the past 15 years have been killed overseas. The bottom line is that Australia is now facing the most significant ongoing threat from terrorism in our nation's history. We recognise that not all returning foreign fighters will engage in terrorist attacks in Australia. But we do believe some will undoubtedly return with the capability and the intent to conduct terrorist attacks in Australia. Moving on to procedures and practices, I'll commence by repeating a truism that was very much to the fore when I undertook the very excellent program on terrorism security studies in 2010. To be effective, Programs for countering foreign fighters must be nested within a broader, comprehensive, whole-of-government counter-terrorism strategy. In addition to legal, border protection, financial control measures, security intelligence capability upgrades, countering violent extremism programs and international cooperation dimensions, such strategies must embrace a commitment to countering the terrorist narrative. The Australian Government has conducted a comprehensive review of the National Counterterrorism Strategy and the supporting framework of policy, procedures, legal provisions and international cooperation programs to ensure Australia has the necessary tools and arrangements in place to mitigate and ultimately defeat the threat of foreign fighters. Australia's strategy for countering terrorism focuses on prevention as the first line of defence. This is pursued through reducing the lure of violent extremist ideologies, stopping Australians from choosing violence to express their views, shaping the global environment to counter terrorism and disrupting terrorism activity within Australia. The practices and procedures that follow are by no means the perfect solution but do illustrate the Australian commitment to a whole of government approach. The Government of Australia has committed to the stripping of Australian citizenship from dual nat nationals who engage in terrorism to either facilitate their removal from Australia or prevent their return. It has cancelled more than 120 passports for reasons relating to potential harmful conduct that might prejudice the security of Australia or another foreign country. Concerned parents may now apply to have their child's passport cancelled if they are concerned their child is planning to travel overseas to fight. Investment on countering violent extremism has been significantly improved. In the legal realm, the Australian Government has declared regions of Iraq and Syria 
to be areas where a listed terrorist organisation is engaging in hostile activity under Australian criminal law. This makes it a criminal offence for a person to enter or to remain in such regions without a legitimate reason. Legislation before the Parliament will enable control orders to be placed on persons as young as 14 years of age to prevent them becoming involved in terrorism activities. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term control orders, control orders restrict an individual's freedom of movement and association without requiring a criminal conviction. Under Australian law, it is an offence to direct the activities of, be a member of, recruit for, train for, or receive training from a listed terrorist organisation. It is an offence to get funds to, from, or for, provide support to, or associate with members of these terrorist organisations. It is also an offence to recruit persons in Australia to either join organisations engaged in hostile activities in a foreign country or serve in or with the armed forces of a foreign country. Australia has passed additional legislation to ensure foreign fighters' welfare payments can be cancelled. Moving on to budget and financial measures. Since August 2014, an additional $1.4 billion Australian dollars has been committed to combating terrorism spread across intelligence capability, strengthening border security and enhancing both secure communications and protective security arrangements. With regard to financial measures, Australia has reviewed and updated its existing robust counter-terrorism financing framework. Next, policy measures. The Australian Government has conducted a review of national counter-terrorism machinery that concluded there was no reason to make major structural changes to existing strong, well-coordinated counter-terrorism arrangements. The Australian Government released an updated national counter-terrorism strategy in July 2015, which is publicly available. Australia has increased its commitment to countering the vilest extremist narrative through maintaining a strong, multicultural society, helping in institutions and sectors of the community to combat violent extremist ideology where it emerges, and challenging and undermining the appeal of terrorist propaganda, especially online. The Australian Government has established a data retention scheme requiring telecommunications companies to retain limited data for a period of two years to ensure law enforcement and national security agencies have the information they require to keep Australia safe. The last area I wish to focus on is international cooperation. Australia is committed to both a regional and a global approach to meet the foreign fighter threat. Australia hosted a regional summit to counter violent extremism in Sydney in June of this year, building on work commenced at the White House Countering Violent Extremism Summit in February this year. Australia has listed individuals for targeted financial sanctions under UNSCR 1373. And Australia is strengthening its engagement with transit and source countries across the Indo-Pacific and Middle East to strengthen both their own and Australia's capacity to disrupt, prosecute and manage the foreign fighter threat. What then are the key challenges? With your indulgence, I am going to widen the aperture to briefly consider what I believe to be the three most significant challenges confronting us globally, rather than present a narrow view of Australia's particular challenges that may have little or no application to your own national circumstances. I think there are three major challenges that demand greater emphasis globally. The first is countering the terrorist narrative. The second is the critical importance of intelligence sharing. And the third is acceptance of the idea that to achieve success, both ends of the foreign fighter pipeline must be addressed concurrently and with equal vigour. Now, harking back to my own time here at the Marshall Centre in 2010, I crafted what I call an ambush question for visiting speakers that went along the following lines. If we were to write a report card on global counter-terrorism efforts in 2010, it may well have reflected straight Bs 
for enhanced border security measures, enhanced international cooperation, including intelligence cooperation, enhanced counter threat financing measures, much improved whole of government crisis management frameworks, and highly effective direct action anti terrorism campaigns. But a very clear fail for effectively countering the terrorist narrative. I contend it was then and continues to be our Achilles heel. I asked why this was so and why such a pitifully small proportion of our national counterterrorism budgets had been directed to that particular line of operations. Other than acknowledging the validity of my crude analysis, no guest speaker then nor since at the many CT fora that I have attended has provided an adequate explanation for this failure to address and then counter the terrorist narrative in a manner proportionate to its obvious significance. Five years later, and many billions, some say possibly a trillion dollars, expended on largely unsuccessful anti-terrorism campaigns, I suggest it is time for a significant rebalance. Clearly it is not easy, or we would have cracked it by now. It will require public recognition that the core of the solution lies within the, within the theological fault lines within the Muslim world that the voices articulating a counter-narrative must be Muslim voices, and recognition within the non-Muslim world that the metrics for managing success cannot be conveniently calibrated to match non-Muslim states' election cycles. Clearly, this is a big ask. Such a global campaign will require financing on a massive scale, but I think we have arrived at a general conclusion that until such time as the terrorist narrative is effectively countered, or at least neutralised, we cannot hope to defeat the threat. <coughs> when applied at the micro level within our own states, I would emphasise the importance of more inclusive community engagement programs, rather than narrowly focused, potentially divisive, national law enforcement programs pursued in isolation. This raises the intriguing question as to whether building social cohesion should come to be regarded as a key element of national security, but that is a question for another gathering such as this. In addition, we must embrace and demonstrate the same awareness of the potential of social messaging media that our opponents do. In all aspects of information operations, it is not enough to be reactive. We must be proactive. Now, the second challenge I wish to address is that of intelligence sharing. Simply put, we cannot hope to prevent, let alone deter, the threat posed by foreign fighters unless we have effective arrangements for the sharing of terrorist-related intelligence, often with non-traditional partners. This poses many challenges, not the least of which is the tension that exists between national self-interest and the interests of others. In the case of Australia, you will recall my mention earlier that by far the great majority of Australians who have died in terrorist attacks over the past 15 years have died overseas. In our case, it is self-evident that if we are to prevent further such occurrences, we must have comprehensive intelligence sharing and capacity building arrangements in place with all of our international partners. Now, the third challenge I wish to address, albeit briefly, is that of widespread acceptance of the notion that to achieve success, both ends of the foreign fighter pipeline must be addressed concurrently and with equal vigour. There is little to be gained by erecting fortress-like domestic defence measures but ceding freedom of manoeuvre to the enemy in the terrorist heartland. To be judged effective and comprehensive, national counterterrorism strategies must embrace and resource campaigns to address the threat at source, at home, and where necessary, at points in between. Much of the commentary directed at securing a, a narrow domestic political advantage in many Western democracies obscures this requirement. In the case of Australia, our recent and ongoing participation in military campaigns in South Asia and the Middle East are testament to our commitment to this challenge. My speaker's brief included a section on best practices, but I've decided that rather than to emphasise 
what I consider to be the best practices tailored to Australia's unique national security circumstances, you are all much better placed to identify and draw from my presentation those elements that have potential relevance for your own unique national circumstances. The only recommendation that I would presume to offer is one that I'm sure you will all agree. That is, we should all convene at the same time next year to review our national progress. But in the Caribbean, enjoying sunshine, calypso and rum punch, rather than the onsen of winter in Europe. And I'm quite sure that the Marshall Centre will be quite prepared to pay. On a more serious note, perhaps by Thursday afternoon, we will all be better informed and in a better position to consider what recommendations we should draw from our discussions. In the last 20 minutes or so, I have outlined the nature of the foreign fighter threat facing Australia, the procedures and practices that the Australian, federal, state and territory governments have adopted to address this threat and offered my thoughts on the key challenges facing us globally rather than a more narrowly focused Australian perspective. I'll leave it, leave it to each of you to draw your own conclusions concerning the utility of my presentation. Thank you very much.